Welcome to Arcade Attack. A retro gaming podcast for up to four players. Welcome to a spooky, spectacular podcast. <laughs> Something a bit different today, but before I go into exactly why it's a bit different, uh, I, I, well, first and foremost, my name's Adrian, so happy to be here, and hopefully you're going to enjoy this podcast. As usual, we've got the, uh, the three amigos, or the four amigos in total, we're going to add them all up in front of me. We've got Dylan. Hello. <laughs> we've got Rob. Hey. And good old Keith. Hello. Right, so guys, uh, I feel like Christmas has come early for me because obviously I've I got the Zelda Ocarina of Time podcast uh, in the can, quite a recent uh, upload, and well, like I said, it's it's come around again where I get to talk a bit more about Zelda. Ah, uh, yay. Yeah. Well, the Ocarina pod was very popular, wasn't it? So, <laughs> I felt obliged. Yeah. Obliged for my lovely fans. <laughs> but now, it's a little bit slightly different podcast today. We're not going to talk... But about Zelda per se, oh! Because in case you've lived in a cave uh, this last uh, last few days, I'm sure you realise that we are very well. We're, we're just in Halloween, really, Halloween season. <laughs> so today, I'm going to treat you to a little ghost story. Don't Ooh. trick us. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll treat you. Though. I'll treat you. Um, Majora's Mask. What do we think about Majora's Mask? Do you remember what I said? Uh, when, when we were talking about the old, the other, my, my rankings of Zelda, what, what did I have to talk about? Was it like the last one? Was it the one you hated? <laughs> I wouldn't say I hate it. No. I don't hate it. I respect it very much. I think it's a very interesting game. It was the three day cycle I didn't quite get oh, my head right. around. But oh, the three day cycle thing, mm, yeah. That, that didn't sound great. Majora's, no, Majora's Mask is nice. Maybe it will find someone else that likes it in a way that you can't. Possibly, exactly. <laughs> a lot of people love the game, and again, I, I think I mentioned it before, I, I really want to love the game. It's actually probably the darkest Zelda game out there. It's kind of spooky, it's, like I said before guys, very similar graphics to Ocarina of Time, but it's a very sort of dark take on things. There's a moon about to crash on your head. But we're not going to take talk, talk too much about the game today, because I want to talk about a ghost story that's, that's evolved from this particular game. Have you um, have you guys ever heard of creepy pastas? Yes. What yes. are they? What are they? I think Rob coined it probably earlier, didn't yeah. you, Rob? Go on, Rob. No, no kidding. <laughs> I'd maybe not altogether complimentary, but no. I'm sure Adrian will change my mind today. They're nice stories. They are horror-related legends or, or images, to be fair, and they've they've evolved basically around the internet, so people have written stories, and it's not always clear where they first originated from. Um, the, the stories can be very brief, or they can be very long, and these stories have, have wow, they've become like proper legends. So they're like internet people. urban legends. Internet basically. urban legends. The yeah. most famous creepy pastor is probably Slender Man. I'm sure we've all heard of Slender Man yeah. before. And sadly the most inspirational one as well. Possibly. So you're not a fan of Slender Man then? No, it's not that. It's just there are those kind of two kids who... Uh, kill someone because and they said that slender man told them to do it that is unfortunately a true story so i read actually about that it's totally true um i'm sure this story will not inspire anyone to murder no hopefully not i don't think it has but i did have a question actually far away did um do they focus on a specific type of pasta (laughs) (laughs) yeah creepy are you you a pasta fairy no a creepy like rigatoni (laughs) <laughs> oh. I think Taglitelli creepy surely. Taglitelli <laughs> spaghetti is basically like guts it's Sp- pretty creepy sure. spaghetti is probably the creepiest pasta I think isn't it? <laughs> it is pretty creepy <laughs> um, before I go into Ben Drowned in more detail there's actually a few video game related cre- uh, creepy pastas um, there's one called Lavender Town Syndrome any, any idea what that could be based oh, on oh yeah Lavender Town it's Pokemon oh, perfect course, Pokemon yeah. and this is um, a legend so another story that's been released uh, about it was actually released just after the first Pokemon Red and Green, and um, again it's a little bit morose this this story. But it, apparently this fictional story talks about 
high death rate between children aged 10 to 15. And these are, these are apparently children that played Pokemon as well. Um, so it's not a particularly nice story, but again, that's a creepy pass that's become very popular. Another one is called Poly, Polybius, Polybius even, there you go. Um, it is, again, an online uh, arcade, so it's an arcade, based on an arcade game. It's similar to Tempest, mm. uh, but, it, but again, mm. quite similar to actual Lavender Town, but this game would cause sort of seizure yeah, flashes. Yeah, I've heard this one. I've yeah, heard you've heard about this yeah. one. Again, I've only got the very brief description here, but it's sort of subliminal messages, and again, it could, could lead to like suicide and quite dark thoughts. There's a one called Sonic.exe, Sonic.exe, and it's um, it's based around a teenager called Tom. Um, lots of delusions playing a haunted ROM hack of Sonic the Hedgehog. So there you go. If you if you want to play uh, if, haunted Sonic, if you're okay. into Sonic, it could be worth um, looking into this. What happened in uh, the haunted Sonic ROM hack? Well, it's uh, it, apparently it shows very disturbing contents. Uh, gore, uh, and apparently it's um, after you, after after you play this game, you get kind of possessed, and you say, "I am God." So it's quite serious, you know. It's pretty pretty crazy stuff. I was hoping it would be like The Ring, where Sonic stops and looks at the screen <laughs> and starts <laughs> getting bigger and bigger, and going to the screen, and then comes out and uh, starts strangling you or something. But fair enough. And, and he does like rings as well. So exactly. Yeah. Ooh, nice. <laughs> ah, nice. nice. Good link. Nice. Yeah, it's got a good, your, your story's got a good ring to it. There you go. There you go. Um, yeah. there's, there's one other, well, there's two more uh, sort of video game creepypastas that have really sort of made it big. The, the last uh, the last one I'll really quickly go over is one called Petscop, or, yeah, Petscop, and it's, um, or Petscop even. And it's, it's based on a fictional PlayStation 1 game uh, released in 1997. But... I, well, Fictionally released in 997. Again, I don't too, don't know too much about the details, but the one I want to talk about today <laughs> is a certain story which I stumbled across about a year ago. Uh, I told you I, I played Majora's Mask about last year, mm. and I put my hands up. There's some tricky bits in that game, and due to the time limit, the three day cycle, when you've got a clock ticking, I, I have to be honest, guys, to work out some of the puzzles and some of the temples, I actually did go on the internet <gasps> for walkthroughs. You never. I had to. And when you're typing in Majora's Mask walkthroughs, obviously, if you go on like YouTube, there's, there's attached videos, isn't there? There goes all our credibility as gamers. Yeah, How yeah. everyone's done it. <laughs> I'm not proud of it. Uh, Play along with it, Keith. I've got to say. Yeah. Oh, it should be a shame. Get out oh. of it and don't come back. But I, there was, I, I kept seeing this Ben Drown, Majora's Mask. What could this be? So I, I done a bit more digging, and it's, uh, it's a story I read last year, and it's quite... Um, it, it, it spooked me out actually I have to say it did spook me out a little bit and I think because I was playing the game at the time it probably had a bit more kind of sort of emphasis so today I'm going to actually in a few minutes actually can actually read you the story of Ben Drowned it's a, it's perf- it's a perfect ghost story perfect for Halloween and um, hey I'm, I'm actually quite proud of it actually before I start reading the story we actually I managed to track down the author of Ben Drowned he's big now he he's is big like, he's, he's got like film offers and whatnot on table. Well, exactly. Alex Hall has kindly given Arcade Attack an exclusive interview, and he, he goes into quite a lot of depth about what how he came up with Ben Drowned and what it's led to, and you know, he's it, it, it's really helped him actually uh, sort of become quite big in the media circles. Um, so I've I've got a couple of questions here. Obviously, the full interview. Please check it out on Arcade Attack. But the first question, or well, one of the questions I asked him is, do you do you remember? How you first got the idea for the compelling and haunting Ben Drown story, and what inspired you? What inspired you to write it? And Alex said, "I remember stumbling across, uh, upon random creepy pasta stories back in 2009, before the genre had established itself yet, and was fascinated by them. I thought it'd be really neat if someone made a story that expanded upon Majora's Mask and the somber themes it touched upon. I remember asking myself, what would make a compelling creepy pasta story to me?" Imagining myself as the potential viewer instead of the author and what would catch my attention and thus the story of Ben Drown was created. He, you know, Majora's Mask, you might love it or hate it, but you can't forget the game. It sucks you in. It's got a really sort of dark mood to it. I completely um, agree with what, what Alex says there. And one more question. I, I love this answer before I uh, get to the story. I asked him, how do you reflect on the reaction to your story and did you ever expect to create such a well-known gaming story? And he said, it, it's still, seven years later, a weird feeling. 
I've been very thankful and blessed to have such a great outpour of support and fans, and it's been such a unique experience that I wouldn't trade it for the world. I've been fortunate enough to be able to hear how I've impacted and inspired people to write that I've never actually met. I've been fortunate enough to be courted by some high-profile film studios looking to make a Hollywood adaption uh, of my story, and I've been fortunate enough to have a fan base of people who enjoy my work. However, sometimes all the attention can be intimidating. I didn't even reveal my real name and face behind the story until 2012, and I've gotten my fair share of interest in stalker fan letters. It does put a lot of pressure on someone, especially when you're trying to create a follow-up story to recapture that same kind of magic. You just know whatever you create next is always going to be compared in some way or another to Ben Drowned. I think subconsciously I needed some time in between my next project for things to cool off a bit before I felt less pressure and could create more freely. It's a ri- and that's just, that's just two answers. He's, he writes so elegantly and he, he obviously Ben Drowned has affected quite a few people. Um, I think most people have just enjoyed the story for what it is. A, few, a small handful have taken it almost a bit too seriously and been properly freaked out by it. Um, like I said, guys, please check out the full interview. Ben, uh, sorry, Alex has kindly allowed, allowed me to use this opportunity to actually tell the story to everyone. So in a minute, pour yourself a drink, you know, get yourself settled down, and hopefully you're going to enjoy the story of Ben Drowned. Post 1. September 7th, 2010. Okay, I need your help with this. This is not copypasta. This is a long read. But I feel like my safety or well-being could very well depend on this. This is video game related, specifically Majora's Mask. And this is the creepiest shit that has ever happened to me in my entire life. Having said that, I recently moved into my dorm room, starting as a sophomore in college. And a friend of mine gave me his old Nintendo N64 to play. I was stoked, to say the least. I could finally play all those games of my youth that I hadn't touched in at least a decade. His Nintendo 64 came with one yellow controller and a rather shoddy copy of Super Smash Bros. And while beggars can't be choosers, needless to say, it didn't take long until I became bored of beating level 9 CPUs. That weekend, I decided to drive around a few neighbourhoods about 25 minutes or so off campus, hitting up the local garage sales, hoping to score on some good deals from ignorant parents. I ended up picking up a copy of Pokemon Stadium, GoldenEye, fuck yeah, F-Zero and two other controllers for two dollars. Satisfied, I began to drive out of the neighbourhood when one last house caught my attention. I still have no idea why I did it. There was no cars there and only one table was set up with random junk on it, but something sort of drew me there. I usually trust my gut on these things, so I got out of the car and I was greeted by an old man. His outward appearance was, for lack of better words, displeasing. It was odd. If you asked me to tell you why I thought he was displeasing, I couldn't really pinpoint anything. There was just something about him that put me on edge. I can't explain it. All I can tell you is that if it wasn't in the middle of the afternoon and there were other people within shouting distance, I would not have even thought of approaching this man. He flashed a crooked smile at me and asked what I was looking for, and immediately I noticed that he must be blind in one of his eyes. His right eye had that glazed over look about it. I forced myself to look into his left eye instead, trying not to offend, and asked if he had any old video games. I was already wondering how I could politely excuse myself from the situation when he would tell me he had no idea what a video game was. But to my surprise, he said he had a few ones in an old box. He assured me he'd be back in a jiffy and turned to head back into the garage. As I watched him hobble away, I couldn't help but notice that he was selling what he was selling on his table. Littered across his table were rather peculiar paintings, various artworks that looked like ink blots that a psychiatrist might show you. Curious, I looked through them. It was obvious no one was visiting this guy's garage sale. They weren't exactly aesthetically pleasing. As I came to the last one, for some reason it looked like Majora's Mask. The same heart-shaped body with little spikes protruding outward. Initially I just thought that since I was secretly hoping to find that game at these garage sales, 
some Freudian bullshit was projecting itself into the ink ink blots. But given the events that happened afterwards, I'm not so sure now. I should have asked the man about it. I wish I would have asked the man about it. After staring at the Majora-shaped blot, I looked up and the old man was suddenly there again, arms length in front of me, smiling at me. I'll admit I jumped out of reflex and I laughed nervously as he handed me an N64 cartridge. It was a standard grey colour, except that someone had written Majora on it in black permanent marker. I got butterflies in my stomach as I realised what a coincidence this was and I asked him how much he wanted for it. The old man smiled at me and told me I could have it for free, that it used to belong to a kid who was about my age that didn't live here anymore. There was something weird about how the man phrased that, but I didn't really pay any attention to then. I was too caught up in not only finding this game, but getting it for free. I reminded myself to be a bit sceptical, since this looked like a pretty shady cartridge, and there's no guarantee it would work. But then the optimist inside me interjected that maybe it was some kind of beta version or pirated version of the game, and that was all I needed to be back on Cloud9. I thanked the man, and the man smiled at me and wished me well, saying goodbye then. At least, that's what it sounded like to me. All the way in the car ride home, I had a nagging doubt that the man had said something else. My fears were confirmed when I booted up the game. To, To my surprise, it worked just fine. And there was one save file named simply Ben. Goodbye, Ben, he was saying. Goodbye, Ben. I felt bad for the man. Obviously a grandparent, and obviously going to see Noel, and I, for some reason or another, reminded him of his grandson, Ben. Out of curiosity, I looked at the save file. Eyeballing it, I could tell he was pretty far in the game. He had almost all of the masks and three quarters remains of the bosses. I noticed that he had actually used an owl statue to save his game. He was on day three and by the stone tower temple with hardly an hour left before the moon would crash. I remember thinking that it was a shame that he had come so close to beating the game, but he never finished it. I made a new file named Link out of tradition and started the game, ready to relive my childhood. For such a shady looking game cartridge, I was quite impressed at how smoothly it ran. Literally just like a retail copy of the game, save for a few minor hiccups here and there, like textures being where they shouldn't be, random flashes of cutscenes at odd intervals, but nothing too bad. However, the only thing that was a little unnerving was that at times the NPCs would call me Link and at other times they would call me Ben. I figured it was just a bug, a fluke in the programming causing our files to get mixed up or something. It did creep me out though and after a while and it was around after I'd beaten the Woodfall Temple that I regrettably went into the save files and deleted Ben. I had intended to preserve the file just out of respect of the game's original owner It's not like I needed two files anyway. Hoping that would solve the problem, it didn't, and it did. Now NPCs wouldn't call me anything. Where my name should be in the dialogue, there was just a blank space. My save file name was still called Link, though. Frustrated, and with homework to do, I put the game down for a day. I started playing the game again last night getting the lens of truth and working my way towards completing the Snowhead Temple. Now, some of you more hardcore Majora Mask players know about the fourth day glitch. For those who don't know, you can Google it. But the gist of it is that right as the clock is, is about to hit midnight on the final day, you talk to the astronomer and look through the telescope. If you time it right, the countdown disappears and you essentially have another day to finish whatever you were doing. Deciding to do the glitch and try and finish the Snowhead Temple, I happened to get it right on the first try, and the time counter at the bottom disappeared. However, when I pressed B to exit the telescope, instead of being greeted by the astronomer, I found myself in the Majora boss fight room at the end of the game, the trippy boxed-in arena. Staring at Skull Kid hovering above me, there was no sound, just him floating in the air above me 
and the background music, which was regular for the area, but still creepy. Immediately, my palms began to sweat. This was definitely not normal. Skull Kid never appeared here. I tried moving around the area, and no, mail, no matter where I went, Skull Kid would always be facing me, looking at me, not saying anything. Nothing would happen, though, and this kept up for around 60 seconds. I thought the game had bugged or something, but I was beginning to doubt that very much. I was about to reach the reset button when the text appeared on my screen. You're not sure why, but you apparently had a reservation. I instantly recognised that text. You get that message when you get the room key from Andrew at the stock pot inn. But why was it playing here? I refused to entertain the notion that it was almost as if the game was trying to communicate with me. I started to navigate the room again, testing to see if that was some sort of trigger that enabled me to interact with something here. Then I realised how stupid I was. To even think that someone could reprogram the game like this was absurd. Sure enough, 15 seconds later, another message appeared on the screen. And again, like the first one, it was already a pre-existing phrase. Go to the lair of the temple's boss, yes or no. I paused for a second, contemplating what I should press and how the game would react. When I realised that I couldn't select no, taking a deep breath, breath, I pressed yes and the screen faded to white with the words dawn of a new day. Where I was ported to filled me with the most intense sense of dread and impending fear I'd ever experienced. The only way I can describe the way I felt here is having this feeling of inexplicable depression on a profound scale. I'm not normally a depressed person, but the way I felt here was feeling that I didn't even knew existed. It was such a twisted, powerful presence that seemed to wash over me. I appeared in some kind of weird Twilight Zone version of Clock Town. I walked out of the Clock Tower, as you normally do when you start from day one, only to find that all of the inhabitants were gone. Usually with a fourth day glitch, you can still find the guards and the dog that runs around outside the tower. This time they were all gone. What replaced them was the ominous feeling that there was something out there. In the same area as me, and that it was watching me. I had four hearts to my name and the hero's bow. But at this point, I wasn't even considering for my avatar. I felt that I personally was in some kind of danger. Perhaps the most chilling thing was the music. It was a song of healing, ripped straight from the game itself, but played in reverse. The music would get louder, building up, so if you should expect something to pop out at you, but nothing ever did, and the constant loop began to wear on my mental state. Every now and then, I would hear the faint laugh of the happy mask salesman in the background. Just quiet enough, so I wasn't sure if I was just hearing things, but just loud enough to keep me determined to find it. I looked in all four zones of Clock Town, only to find nothing, no one. Texas were missing, West Clock Town had me walking on air, the entire area felt broken. Hopelessly broken. As the reverse song of Hidden repeated for what must have been the 50th time, I just remember standing in the middle of the South Clock Town, realising that I had never felt so alone in a video game before. As I walked through the ghost town, I don't know whether it was the combination of the out of place textures and the atmosphere and the haunting melody of the once peaceful and soothing song being butchered and distorted, but I was literally on the verge of tears and I had no idea why. I hardly ever cry. Something had gripped me here and this powerful sense of depression that was both foreign and crippling. I tried leaving Clock Town, but every time I attempted to zone out, the screen would fade to black and I would just zone in another part of the Clock Town. I tried playing my ocarina. I wanted to escape and I did not want to be here. But every time I played the Song of Time or the Song of Sorin, it would say, your notes echo far, but nothing happens. By this point, it was obvious the game didn't want me to leave, but I had no idea why it was keeping me here. I didn't want to go inside the buildings. I felt 
that I would be too vulnerable there to whatever I was terrified of. I don't know why, but I came up with the idea that maybe if I drowned myself at the laundry pool, I could spawn somewhere else and leave this place. As I zoned in and ran towards the pool, that's when it happened. Link grabbed his head and the screen flashed for a brief moment of the happy mask salesman smiling at me. Not Link, me, with Skull Kid's screen playing in the background. And when the screen returned, I was staring at the Link statue from playing the song of Elegy of Emptiness. I screamed as the thing just stared at me with his, that haunted facial expression. I turned around and ran out and back into South Clocktown, and to my horror, the fucking statue followed me in the only way I can compare. Like, it's like the weeping angels from Doctor Who. Every so often, at random intervals, the animation would play of the statue appearing behind me. It was like the thing was chasing me, or, I don't even want to fucking say it, haunting me. By this point, I was on the verge of hysterics, but not even once did the thought of turning off the console occur to me. I don't know why. I was so wrapped up in it, the terror felt all so real. I tried to shake the statue, but it would literally appear right behind me every single time. Link started to begin to make weird animations I'd never even seen him do before. He would flail his arms around or spasm randomly, and the screen would cut to the happy Mars salesman smiling again for a brief moment before I was face to face with that fucking statue again. I ended up running into the Swords Master's dojo and ran into the back. I don't know why, but, I, but in my panic, I just wanted some kind of assurance that I'm not alone here. To my dismay, I found no one. But as I turned to leave the statue, cornered me in the cubby in the back, I tried attacking the statue with my sword, but to no avail, confused and backed into a corner, I just stared at the statue waiting for it to kill me. Suddenly the screen flashed again to the happy Mars salesman and Link turned to face my screen. Standing upright, mirroring the statue, looking at me with his copy, literally staring at me. Whatever was left of the fourth wall was completely shattered while I ran at the dojo terrified. Suddenly the game warped me to an underground tunnel and the reverse song of healing queued up again as I was given a brief moment of rest before the statue started appearing behind me again, this time aggressively. I could only take a few steps before it was summoned behind me again. I hurriedly made my way out the tunnel and, ap and appeared in South Clocktown. As I ran aimlessly in sheer panic, suddenly a re-dead screamed and the screen faded to black as dawn of a new day appeared again. The screen faded in and I was standing on top of Clock Tower Skull Kid hovering, hovering over me again, silent. I looked up and the moon was back, looming just metres above my head. But the Skull Kid just stared at me hauntingly with that fucking mask. A new song was playing, the Stone Tower Temple theme played in reverse. In some sort of desperate attempt, I equipped my bow and fired off a shot at the Skull Kid and it actually hit him and he played an animation of him reeling back. I fired again and on the third arrow, a text box appeared saying, that won't do any good, he he. And I was picked off the ground, levitated upwards on my back, and then Link screamed as he burst into flames, instantly killing him. I jumped when this happened. I'd never seen this move used by anyone in the game, and Skull Kid himself didn't have any moves. As the death screen played, my lifeless body still burning, the Skull Kid laughed and the screen faded to black, only to have me reappear in the same place. I decided to charge him, but the same thing happened. Link's body was lifted off the ground by some unknown force and he immediately burst into flames again, killing him. This time during the death scene, the faint sounds of the reverse on the healing could be heard. On my third and final try, I noticed that there was no music playing this time that all there was was eerie silence. I remembered that in the original encounter with the Skull Kid, you were supposed to use the ocarina to either travel back in time or summon the giants. I attempted to play the Song of Time, but before I could hit the last note, Link's body once again horrifically exploded into flames and he died. 
As the death screen neared its end, it began to chug as if the cartridge was trying to process a lot of something. When the screen came to it, it was the same scene as the first three times, except this time Link was lying on the ground dead in a position I had never seen in the game before. His head tilted towards the camera, with the skull kid floating above him. I couldn't move. I couldn't press any buttons. All I could do is just stare at Link's dead body. After around 30 seconds of this, the game simply fades out with the message, you've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Before kicking you out to the title screen. Upon getting back to the title screen and starting again, I noticed my save file was no longer there. Instead of Link, it was replaced with Your Turn. Your Turn had three hearts, zero masks and no items. I selected Your Turn and immediately when I did, I was returned to the clock tower rooftop scene of my Link dead and the skull kid hovering over, with the skull kids laughing, looping again and again. I quickly hit the reset button and when the game booted up again, there was one more save file added. Below your turn, entitled Ben. Ben's save file was right back where it was before I deleted it, at the stone tower temple with the moon almost crashing. I turned the game off at this point. I'm not superstitious, but this is way too fucked up, even for me. I haven't played it at all today. Hell, I didn't even get any sleep last night. I kept hearing the reverse of my healing music in my head, and just remembering the sense of dread I felt exploring Clock Town. I drove back to the old man's house today to ask him some questions with a buddy of mine. No way I was going there alone. Only to find that there's, no, there's a for sale sign in the front yard. And when I rang the door, no one was home. So now I'm back here writing down the rest of my thoughts and recording what happened. Sorry if some of this has gram grammatical errors and, and whatnot. I'm running on no sleep here. I'm terrified of this game, even more so that I've relived it a second time, writing this all down. But I feel like there's still more to it than meets the eye. And there's something calling me to investigate this further. I think Ben is something in this equation, but I don't know what. And if I can get hold of the old man, then I'd be able to find some answers. I need another day or so to recuperate before tackling this game again. It's already taken a toll on my sanity, I feel like. But next time I do this, I'm going to be recording my footage all the way through. The idea to record only came to me towards the end. So you, so you can see the last few minutes of what I saw, including Skull Kid and the Elegy statue, but it's on YouTube here. I'm going to stay in this thread for a little while longer before I fall asleep to answer any questions you guys might have, or hopefully listen to your ideas or theories to help me shed some light into this, or maybe things I should try to do. I think I'm going to play Ben's file tomorrow to see what happens. Maybe I was supposed to do that all along. I don't believe in paranormal shit but this is a little too fucked up. And maybe this Ben guy is just a really good hacker programmer. I don't want to think about the alternative if he isn't. That's the end of the copy paste. I'm hoping that maybe this is some kind of running gag the developers had and the other people had gotten gag or hacked copies of the game like this. This just really scares me. Post 2. September the 8th, 2010. I'm going to post what happened and link the video footage, but last night, everything got too real for me. I think I'm done messing around with this. I passed out pretty much immediately after making that thread. But last night, that elegy of emptiness statue, I had a dream about it. I dreamed that it was following me in my dream, and that I'd be minding my own business when I'd feel my neck hair stand up on end. I would turn around that thing, that horrible lifeless statue would be staring with those empty eyes right at me, merely inches away. In my dream I remember calling it Ben, and never before had I a dream that I could remember so vividly. But the important thing is, I did get some sleep I suppose. Today, putting off playing the game as long as I could, I drove, drove back up that neighbourhood to see if the old man had come back. As I expected, the car was still gone and no one was home. As I was walking back to my car, the man next door mowing the grass killed the power of his lawnmower 
and asked me if I was looking for someone. I told him that I was looking to talk to the old man that lived here, to which he told me what I already knew. He was moving. Trying a different avenue, I asked if the old man had any family or relatives I could talk to. I discovered that this old man had never been married, nor did he have any children or or grandchildren through adoption. Starting to become uh, worried, I asked one final question, and one I should have asked from the beginning. Who was Ben? The man's expression turned grim, and I learned that four doors down, around eight years ago, on April 23rd, the man informed me that it was the same day as his anniversary. That's how he knew the specific date. There was an accident with a young boy named Ben in the neighbourhood. Shortly after his parents moved, and despite any further attempts to talk to the man to get more attention, he wouldn't divulge anything else. I went back and started playing again. I load up the game and immediately I jumped at the title screen where the mask flies by. The sound that played was not the normal whoosh sound. It was something much more higher pitched. I pressed start, bracing for the worst. But just like two nights ago, the files Your Turn and Ben were displayed. Truth be told, I looked at the Ben file earlier. It seems to fluctuate between displaying the owl save and not. I brought up the Ben file, hesitated for a moment, noticing that the stats were not the same as they were originally two days ago. It seemed like he had already completed the Stone Tower Temple this time. Summoning my courage, I selected it. Immediately, I was thrust into complete chaos. Sure enough, I was outside Stone Tower Temple, but that's about all that was expected. The zone itself wasn't called Stone Tower Temple, but rather S-T-O-N-E and immediately a dialogue box of complete gibberish that I couldn't make out greeted me Link's body was distorted his back was cocked violently to the side where his posture was permanently disfigured Link's expression was dull, almost monotonous he had an expression on his face that I didn't recognise before it was a blank look as if he was dead As Link stood there, his body spasmed irregularly, back and forth. I examined what had become of my avatar, and noticed I had a C-button item I had never seen before. Some kind of note, but pressing it did nothing. Sounds played back and forth that I didn't recognise from the game, almost demonic in nature. And there was some kind of high-pitched yip, or some kind of laugh, or something playing in the background. I had all of two minutes to take in the environment before another one of those fucking elegy of emptiness statues was summoned. And immediately, after I was cut into the dawn of a new day screen, except this time it was without the subtext. I was a decade scrub in Clocktown. This scene would normally play after the first time you travel back in time. Tattle would say, what what just happened? As As if anything has. But instead of saying started over, she finished her remark in broken text as the laugh of the happy Mars salesman played in the background. I was put back in control of my character, but from a fucked up camera angle, I was looking from behind the door to the clock tower, watching my avatar run around as a decky scrub. Seeing as I really had no place to go because I couldn't see anything, I begrudgingly went inside the door. There I was greeted by the happy Mars salesman, who simply told me, You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Before the screen whited out. I was in Tamina Field as a human again. I might well as not have been playing the game anymore. I was just being walked around and there was no sign of a day clock or anything. I took a moment to get my bearings as I looked around the field and immediately I could tell this was not normal. There were no enemies and a twisted version of the Happy Mars Salesman theme was playing. I decided to run towards Woodfall before I noticed a gathering of three figures off to one side, one of them being a pona. As I approached them, to my horror, I saw the happy Mars salesman, the skull kid and the elegy of emptiness statue just standing there. I figured maybe they were bugged out, but by now I told myself that I should know better. Nevertheless, I approached them carefully 
and found that the Skull Kid was playing some kind of idle animation on loop. Same with Epona, and the energy of emptiness statue was doing what it was doing all along, just standing there eerily. It was the Happy Mars salesman that scared me more profoundly than the other two. He too was idle, wearing that shit-eating grin, but wherever I moved, his head slowly turned and followed me. I had not engaged in any dialogue with him, nor was I in combat with him, yet his head still continued to follow my movements. Reminded of my first encounter with the Skull Kid on top of Clock Tower, I pulled out my ocarina, to which the game played the ding sound when you're supposed to play ocarina, and tried a song I hadn't played yet, the Happy Mars Salesman's own song, and the song that I'd been playing on loop back in day four, the song of healing. I finished playing the song, and as I did, an ear-piercing shriek blasted on my TV. The sky immediately started flashing. The Happy Mars Salesman twisted theme song sped up, intensifying the fear inside me, and Link exploded into flames and died. The three figures stayed lit up during my death scene as they watched my lifeless body burn. I can't describe to you how sudden and terrifying the tr- transition from eerie to, her- to terror it is. You're going to have to watch the video if you want to see it firsthand. That same fear that caused me to lose sleep two days ago started to grip me again as I was met with a text. You've met with a horrible fate, haven't you? For the third time. There has to be some kind of meaning behind that. I had little time to ponder as I was immediately given another small cutscene of transforming into a Zora and now I found myself in Great Temple Bay. Hesitant but curious to see what the game had in store for me, I slowly made my way towards the beach where I found Epona. I wondered why the game had decided to put up, put her there. Was the game implying she was trying to get a drink, unable to take the mask off? I decided that riding the steed wasn't the reason she was placed here. Suddenly, I realised that Epona kept neighing, and the way she was angled made, made it look like she was trying to signal a point to me off in the distance. It was a hunch, but I dove into Great Bay and started swimming. Sure enough, I almost missed it. I found something at the bottom of the ocean. One last elegy of emptiness statue. I went down to examine, and suddenly my Zora started doing a choking animation I'd never even seen a Zora do before, which didn't even make sense because Zoras can breathe underwater. Regardless, my character choked to death and died, and again the statue was the only thing that was highlighted in my death. I didn't respawn this time. I was booted back to the main menu, as if I'd restarted the console. The press start screen was before me. I knew the only reason why it would put me here is because the save files had changed again. Taking a deep breath, I pressed start and I was right. The new save files told me about Ben. Now it made sense why the statue appeared when I tried to go to the laundry pool. The game must have anticipated how I would have tried to escape the day four clock town. The two save files told me his fate. As I suspected, Ben was dead. The game obviously isn't through with me. It taunts with me with new save files. It wants me to keep playing. It wants me to go further. But I'm done with this shit. I'm not touching any more of the files. This is already way too horrifying for me. And I don't even believe in the paranormal. But I'm running out of explanations. Why would someone send me this message? I don't understand it. I just get too depressed thinking about this. The footage is up here for those who want to see it and try to analyse it. Maybe there's some kind of coded message in the gibberish or something symbolic in what I went through. I'm too emotionally and mentally drained to fuck with it anymore. Post 3, September 10th, 2010. I know it's early in the morning. I've stayed up all night. I can't sleep. I don't care if people see this. That's not the point. I just want the word to get spread so I don't suffer for nothing. I've lost the will to type about this. The less I dwell on this, the better. I think the video just speaks for itself. I did what you guys told me. I played the Elegy of Emptiness song at the first prompt by the game I was given. But I think that's what the game, or Ben... Jesus Christ, I can't believe I'm even humouring the absurd idea that it exists in the game, 
wanted me to do. He's following me now. Not just in the game, he's in my dreams. I see him all the time, behind my back, just watching me. I haven't gone to any of my classes. I stayed in my dorm room with the windows closed and the blinds shut. That way, I know he can't watch me. But he still gets me when I play. When I play, he can see me. The game is scaring me now. It talked to me for the first time. Not just using text that's already in the game. It actually spoke to me. Talked to me. It referenced Ben. It talked to me. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it wants. I never wanted this. I just want my old life back. Stuff like this doesn't happen to people like me. I'm just a kid. Not even old enough to drink yet. It's not fair. I want to go home. I want to see my parents again. I'm so far away from home here at this school. I just want to hug my mum again. I just want to forget that statue's horrible blank face. My original game file is back. Just the way I left it before it was gone. I don't want to play it anymore. I feel like something bad will happen if I don't. But that's impossible. It's a video game. Haunted or not, it can't hurt me, right? Like, seriously, seriously though, it can't, right? That's what I keep telling myself. But every time I think about it, I'm not so sure. Post 4, September the 12th, 2010. Let me just clear things up. I know you guys are worried, but Jad Usable is okay. He finished moving out today, and he said he's going back home. He's just taking the semester off. I'm not really sure what's happened. I have a vague idea, but you guys probably know more than I do. I'm Jad Usable's roommate, and obviously I knew something was wrong with him for a few days now. He stayed in his room all the time, fell out of contact with literally all of his friends, and I'm pretty sure he hadn't been eating hardly anything. After the second day, I couldn't stay in there anymore, so I've been crashing at a buddy's place, only coming into my room to get the stuff that I need. I tried talking to him several times, but he would cut me off or keep the conversation brief when I asked him about his strange behaviour. It was like he was convinced something was hunting him. Yesterday I came to grab my philosophy book and he approached me looking awful. Horrible bags under his eyes. He handed me a flash drive and gave me specific instructions. He told me that he needs me to do one last favour for him. He finally explained to me what has been going on. Gave me the account info to his YouTube account and told me that he's getting away from here. That it lured him to play again instead of trying to change things and that he shouldn't have done that. And to upload the footage and inform people what happened. I told him that he could do it himself and he got this wild look in his eyes and told me that he's never looking at that game again and that's the last thing he said to me. He never even said bye when his parents came to pick him up. I never even got to meet his parents. I honestly can't tell you what happened. When he spoke it was kind of hard to understand him and his fucked up appearance really distracted me. On the flash drive there was the footage of the game last night, a text document with his name and password for YouTube and a third document called the truth.txt containing what he told me were his notes that he'd taken. He told me that this meant everything to him, that I follow his instructions exactly. Normally I wouldn't be so to the letter for a request over a fucking video game, but the way he spoke and the way he looked made me know this was really serious, and I'm going to honour that. I've had this video since yesterday, but had to have someone help me use Pinnacle, that's not really my forte. After watching it, I had to go back through and look at his other videos on his YouTube account to realise what was going on. And even then, I'm really, really confused. The video I'm releasing tonight, the truth.txt, will be released on September 15, just like he requested. I haven't dared peek at it yet, so the first time I see it will be the first time you see it, out of respect to my friend. To answer your questions, no, I haven't tried calling him yet. I think I'll give him a call tomorrow to see if he's okay. He should have gotten back home by now. About the video. In this video I cut straight to when he loaded the Ben file in the game. Looking back I realised that Jad Usable left the save select screen in because it said different names sometimes. So my bad for that. But all it said this time was the same at the end of his last video. Link and Ben. Nothing different. I wasn't there when he played it. But it looks to me like in the beginning when he first spawns he's testing out his equipment or seeing what items he has or something. Because apparently they've changed randomly before. Then, after that, I just think the game got too personal for him. Post 5, September the 15th, 2010. Hey guys, Jad Usable here. This will be the last time you'll be hearing from me. And this is my final gift to you. 
These are the notes I've taken and the realisations I've made. Before I delve into this, I want to thank you for following me and thank you for listening. It feels like the weight of a powerful burden is about to be lifted. By the time you read this, I won't be around anymore. But after spending four days with this maddening game, I've begun to understand what's really at play here. And hopefully after reading this, we can ensure this will never happen again. There are things that I could not share with you why this was going on due to the circumstances to which I'll explain. With Ben blocking any attempt I made to try and relay the truth to you, I tried ever so subtly to warn you guys in various ways. Amidst the chaos and delirium, I devised uh, a make a barely noticeable pattern in my videos. In all my five videos I recorded over the four days, I have either used the mask of truth, interacted with a gossip stone, or the lens of truth equipped at some point. For you Zelda enthusiasts, these are all symbols of honesty and trustworthiness, and I would hope that one of you may, may have picked up on the reference. As I played the file, which I would name Ben, being mindful how, how Ben was watching over him by every move in the game, I made a point to avoid doing anything too obvious. But I sent out a hidden message to you guys. I never equipped the lens, nor the mask, nor visited a stone. It worked, and the video was uploaded. I prayed that someone would notice the pattern. It didn't apply to Ben. The tags followed suit too. I hope you guys paid attention to those as well. They were all little messages to you, nothing big enough that would catch Ben's attention or make him suspect any suspect anything, with Ben manipulating and changing my files. I honestly hope that what you guys saw was close to actually what happened, but there is no way for me to know. This may be a long read, I don't have time to proofread or make any of my research pretty, but here it all is. September the 6th, 2010, 11pm. Can't believe what happened. Not sure if this, this is some kind of elaborate hoax. Despite the fear, I can't help but be exceptionally curious about this. Who or what is this statue? Lots of questions here. I'm starting this document as a diary so I can keep track of everything. I'm typing up a summary of what happened so I can come back to it later. September the 7th, 2010. September the 7th, 2010. 2 a.m. Summary was posted here. You can go back and look at my first post for day 4.wmv for that. 4.23 a.m. I can't sleep. I've been trying so hard, but the harder I try, it just gets more restless. I just feel like that statue is appearing whenever I close my eyes. 8.20 a.m. Didn't sleep at all. Just going to start my day. I don't think I have the energy to go to class today. I'm going to drive back down to talk to the old man taking my buddy Tyler with me just in case. 1.18pm, back home now. No sign of the old man, really weird that he appears to be moving the next day, but maybe the for sale sign was up there yesterday and I just didn't notice it. Tyler wants to know what's gotten into me and got me all worked up. I didn't tell him. Going to eat, feel like death. 3.46pm, could have sworn driving back from the subway that I saw the energy statue buried in some shrubbery staring at me go by. Now I definitely, definitely need some sleep. 5pm. Don't think a lot of people would believe me if I told them about what's happening. Think I'm going to try posting this on the internet. Think I'll just use the summary. These notes are pretty sporadic. 6pm. 6pm. Connected my capture card to my computer to upload the footage. Thought my computer froze for a second. Made a strange popping sound when I hooked everything up. But now it seems to be working fine again. My computer can't die on me now. 7pm. Footage is finished uploading. The quality is a lot better than I thought it would be. Gee, guess this is a really special cartridge. Never had it come through this clear before. 8.45pm. I thought I saw an icon pop up, pop up on my desktop that looked like a statue's face for a split second. Gave me quite a scare. Getting really, really unnerved and delirious. I'm going to crash after this. 9pm. Begin uploading my YouTube video on an alternate account. 9.03pm. I don't remember having uploaded a Vampire, the Masquerade Bloodlines video last year. This was probably the account that I shared with a friend of mine last summer. I hope he doesn't mind me using it to upload this. 9.55pm. 
posting my summary of day four with a link to a YouTube video. Going to try and stay awake, but I'm so tired right now. September the 8th, 2010, 10.48 a.m. I had a dream about the statue. I dreamed that it was following me in my dream, that I'd be <laughs> minding my own business. When I feel my neck hair stand up on end, I turn around, that thing, that horrible lifeless statue, will be staring with those empty eyes right at me, merely inches away. In my dream, I remember calling it Ben, power of suggestion most likely, and never before had I had a dream that I could remember so vividly. 11.21am, I really don't want to play this game again. I think I'm going to go back to see if that old man's there instead. 1.35pm, no old man. But I had an interesting conversation with his neighbour. I'll post the full thing with the summary of my tonight's attempt at playing the game. Going to wait for a bit though, and see if, if I can't dig up any more information on this Ben guy. 2.45pm, I've been getting random and explicable headaches due to the lack of sleep and keep hearing that song in my head. Also, it's flu season, so I need to be careful not to get sick. My immune system is going to be shit right now because of all that all-nighters. 3pm, my computer, just on its own, opened up a text document and wrote the words, hi, and www.cleverbot.com by itself. What the fuck? 3.46pm, I went to the website. It's one of those bot chatting programs. I think it's best if I let the conversation speak for itself. September 9, 2010 conversation. Hello? Hello. Who is this and how are you able to control my computer? Who am I? Right, forgot. You're a bot. Do you really think that? Listen, I know whoever's fucking with my computer can see my screen right now. Yes? Yeah, and I'll wager you're one of those IT kids who thinks he's tough shit. You know what you're doing right now is illegal, right? Is it? <laughs> no shit. Are you familiar with, with the terms invasion of privacy? Get the fuck off my computer, kid. I am your computer. Cool story. Anyway, I'm calling DPS. You picked a bad time to fuck with me, kid. Should I wait until you play the game, then? What? That game. Majora's Mask? Yes. How did you know about that? Because. Because what? I did it. Did what? I played with you. What the fuck? Were you scared? Who the fuck is this? Ben. The statue. You're inside my computer now. Yes. How? You connected me. How the hell did I connect you? Cables and cords. How? Tell me about yourself. What? Tell me about yourself. What do you mean? What is it that really scares you? What the fuck? Answer. No. Answer. What the fuck? How the fuck did you just open that by yourself? I am your computer now. How much can you control? All. What do you want from me? To entertain. You're stuck inside there. You can't hurt me. Ha. Huh. Go play. No, you can't hurt me. Took you longer to type that. So? You're not sure. If you're so powerful, why use a ridiculous website like this to chat with me? Less messy. More structured. Fun. Fun? Yes. Tradition. I like it. You think it's funny? Amusing. And my notes? You may write them down. Why are you letting me? It is amusing to see what you think of me. Window closes. 3.50pm. <laughs> what have I done? I've invited it into my computer. I continue to write these notes, write my summaries. I feel like I'm a prisoner in my one place of security. I don't know. I don't know if I'm hallucinating or not. I feel like I'm a fucking insane right now. I can feel it watching over me. Even as I type this, Ben is controlling everything in the game, toying with me, leading me like a sheep. But for what? What's the purpose? I know Ben drowned, but but why these hauntings? What the fuck am I even doing? You can probably even see this right now. 4.35pm, the summary of the Ben.wmv playthrough. 7.18pm, Ben called me to Cleverbot again. He tells me he's sorry and he wants to be free and that I can free him. That's just like how he got on my computer from the capture card. He can spread, but he needs my help. 
He says I'm special because I can help him. That is the first nice thing he has said. He promises to leave me alone if I do it. He swears he will. I don't know what to think right now. How can I even trust this thing? 7.20pm. I'm terrified of it. But now it's saying that it was just having fun. It's twisted and fucked up version of fun. He's saying the game is over. I do want it to be over. He says that he just wants to be free. That he's trapped in the cartridge and my computer and he wants to be freed. I don't want to have to deal with this shit. I don't know how long I can deal with this watching. It's watching my every move, every stroke. I have nothing private anymore. It knows everything that's been on my computer. It tells that if it wanted to, it could do horrible things to me. But it hasn't, so I should trust it. 8pm. Something tells me that I'm being played again, just like in the game. 9.29pm. Ben called me to Cleverbot again. I ignored it and I went to take a shower. When I came to the laptop, I was welcomed with an image elegy statue staring at me with those dead eyes. I don't want to talk to him. 9.44pm. Fuck you, Ben. I'm not talking to you. 9.56pm. Fuck you, Ben. I'm not talking. 6 past 10 p.m. Fuck you, Ben. I'm not talking to you. 10, 12 p.m. Fuck you, Ben. I am not talking to you. 10, 45 p.m. It's been more than half an hour and the messages have stopped. Ben has stopped. I'm beginning to think that Ben isn't confined to just my computer cartridge. I'm beginning to feel something. It's hard to explain it. I've never been spiritual, but there's something different about the air in my dorm room now. 11.42pm, I'm beginning to see the elegy statue randomly as I search the internet in places I shouldn't, places where you shouldn't be. I'll be scrolling down and suddenly I'll be staring at a picture, a picture of the elegy statue, always the elegy statue. I don't know how much more I can take of this. September the 9th, 2010, 12.35am, my worst fears confirmed, Ben has tampered with my summary of Ben.wmv. I looked at the summary that I posted on various forums for the Ben.wmv file and parts have been omitted. There is no ben mention of Ben existing outside the game. There is no mention of the Moon Children. How could he have been this quick to delete the post without me noticing? I'm wondering if maybe it appeared to me that I was posting everything, but in reality, Ben was posted his own censored version. I'm going to ask Ben why he did it. 12.50 a.m. He isn't responding to me on Cleverbot. It's just giving the generic responses it usually does. I'm just talking to a bot this time. 1.24 a.m. I think Ben is mad at me. 10.43 a.m. The moon children appeared in my dreams last night. They lifted up their masks to reveal their hideously disfigured faces. Maggots crawling out of their offices, sunken black holes where their eyes should be. A yellow smile that slowly grew bigger and bigger as they came closer to me. They told me they wanted to play. I tried to run from them, but the four children pinned me down to the ground with surprising strength. Over them stood the happy mask salesman, announcing he had a new mask that he wanted me to try. In his spastic southern movements, matching his in-game appearance, he took out a mask of moulded off of someone's face that I couldn't recognise, a younger looking face, and it handed it to the moon children, Giggling, they latched it to my face, their horrible, broken bodies bouncing up and down. Two of them held me down, while the other two began to sew the mask onto my face. My shrieks and screams caused the happy mask salesman's face to turn into the most horrific smile I had ever seen. He sporadically moved around, examining this procedure like a curious doctor in that impossible movement. I flayed around, but it was no use. My eyes rolled back in my back to my head because of the pain. It felt so real, but I couldn't wake up. I couldn't wake up no matter how hard I tried to wake up. After the mask was melded onto my flesh, they began sewing my legs together. Then my arms. The horrific feeling of a needle punching your legs and pulling them in, rupturing your Achilles tendons and tying them together resonated throughout my entire body. I tried to scream, but the mask was pressed so tightly against my face it was my new face, and my new face had no mouth. I didn't make a sound. I tried telling myself in my head that I was dreaming. I tried telling myself again and again, and suddenly the moon children stopped and looked at me. They just stared, and the happy mask salesman slowly bent down 
and stared at me, inches away from my face, and grinned when he simply said, You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Before the moon children resumed with increased vigour. I couldn't wake up. I couldn't wake up. It wouldn't let it wouldn't let me wake up until they had crafted me into another elegy statue. I woke up sweating, crying, and shaking uncontrollably. I immediately ran to my commuter and went for Ben. September 9th, 2010. Conversation 2. Answer me, Ben. Welcome back. What is the point of doing this? Why? Amusing to see. How? Fun to play. Fun to toy with you. Make you feel safe. I wonder how you would have reacted. If I hadn't revealed myself and stayed hidden, only doing little things to play with you. Close out your windows. Turn off your computer. Move your mouse by itself. Little things. Make you wonder if I am there, but you never know. Give you little hints that I am. I wanted to do something different with you. You did this before? Yes, and I will do it again. To who? Ben? Hmm. Did you know Ben? Won't tell that information to you. How did Ben die? You know. No, but how did he drown? Won't tell that to you. Why? It is reserved for another. Who? Another who asks. When? Later. The window is closed. I'm beginning to think that this thing maybe isn't Ben at all. In its sadistic nature, I wouldn't be surprised if it took the boy's name after it killed him. 12.04pm. My room is beginning to feel different again. There's something out there. I feel really threatened, like there is something that is trying to reach out to me and and strangle me, but it can't quite get there. 12.46pm. I think Ben doesn't want to play with me anymore. I'll play again. I'll play the game again. Ben, can you see this? I'll play the game again, please. Just stop this, please, please. 1.41pm. I'm going insane, trying to decide what is real and what isn't. Is Ben just playing a trick on me, or is this for real? Is Ben generating these replies, or are people actually posting them? Did I I just see the screen flicker, or was it my imagination? Imagine depending on the internet and trusting your eyes for your entire life, and then being blinded. You can't rely on it anymore. You second guess everything. And for the brief moments, I am looking at my responses to the videos. People are pointing at things that look fake or photoshopped or whatever. And there was literally no way for me to know if Ben changed something on purpose to try and shut me up. Or if maybe those replies were just constructed by Ben to try and discourage me from ever reaching out. See, I get fucking caught in an infinite mind loop just like this. And what what has been wearing on my sanity and pushing me to the edge? As I'm writing this, there's no way of even telling if anyone cares as much as I think they do. Just another fucking trick. Is this whole document even exist? Am I writing nothing? September 9th, 2010. Conversation 3. What is it? What's the point of playing? I die whenever I do anything. You die because you can't figure out the secret. What? Thematic. What the fuck are you talking about? There is beauty in your suffering. The window is closed. 4pm. Ben is making me play the game again. It tells me that it's something very important to show me. September the 10th, 2010. 11.52am. The drowned.wmv playthrough was up when I woke up today. I remember t- typing it, but I don't ever even remember posting it. He censored it again. There is no mention of the old man. I have no voice anymore. I can, I'm only posting what he wants me to. I am the mask he uses to disguise himself as he lies. 11.55am. There's an entire video summary of a video that I don't remember doing. Reading through the summary, this sounds morbid, resembling my dream from two nights ago, except on a far more sadistic scale. These moon children, there's something more to them. Almost if there's another entity from Ben. Something happened last night that I can't remember. I'm posting the full summary to the forums now. The shadow of my chair moved. 12 p.m. Ben won't let me visit YouTube. I can browse the rest of the sites, but he keeps on exiting the video, the window when I go to YouTube. Why? 2 p.m. I feel in the air start to constrict. I don't think I'm alone here, but whatever aura has been here is getting more violent. 2.44 p.m. I'm trying to contact Ben on Cleverbot. He's not responding. I just get the AI. 
3.51 p.m. My uh, my ears aren't falling me. I'm hearing the reverse song of healing. I, I keep hearing it. 4.23 p.m. Now I'm positive of it. Earlier, I thought it was a weird coincidence. But just now, I went to open my window. Three doors down at ground level, I saw the old man. I'm completely positive I did. The same guy. He, he was just staring up at my window, staring in the middle of the campus. If any students took notice of him, they didn't seem to acknowledge him. That's where my notes end. I fled my room, taking the cartridge with me. I don't want to go into details what happened. I'll lose my train of thought as I hammer out these last details. It's been roughly two days since then. This is my last summary and service to you of the final videos you guys saw. Matt.wmv The last video entry I made, Matt.wmv, began as normal. I, w I was spawned in clock down as usual and nothing seemed to be out of, the of place. Des determined to set things right and play the oath of to order. On top of the clock tower on the fourth day, I prepared myself. I sped up time, got to the final day, making my way to the observatory. As I got up to the telescope room and approached the astronomer, he would not let me look into his telescope. He told me it would be cheating and that I should follow my rules. Despite my repeated efforts, the game would not let me go to the fourth day glitch, no matter how hard or what I tried. I tried working around the game and doing the glitch, but it was adamant this time. Regardless of it, I simply had the illusion of free will in prior games. This time, the game became more aggressive than anything I've ever seen. It eventually told me to go to Icarnia Canyon, where the game would end, and it would stop haunting me. Anxious and desperate to end the nightmare, I played the Song of Sorin, and ended up there. I was told to check my inventory, that I'd find the answers to where to end the game. I arrived at Karnath Canyon and saved my progress at Stowachi. As I searched through my inventory, I finally noticed that I was missing a recurring song, The Elegy of Emptiness. Obviously, once I travelled there and learned the song, I suppose that was the last thing it needed before Ben decided he had enough fun playing with me. Ben is a manipulator. He tries to fool his victims into security and makes you drop your guard like a Venus flytrap. He ensnares you. I am nothing but a puppet to him. He enjoys seeing what kind of human emotions he can tap into by doing different things. There are still some things this whole experience that still don't make sense, but then again, I never was good at figuring out these things and I'm not exactly in the right state of mind to. I'm giving you all the pieces of the puzzle for you to analyse and piece together the missing links. I'm typing these closing thoughts on the library computer on campus and I've emailed myself the notes I've stored on my infected computer from the last four days. I'm then going to combine these copy-paste those notes with them, with the closing openings that I've typed here on the safe public computer into one text document. I'm not taking any chances, Brad and Ben. I would not wish this horrible torment on anyone and I've made sure to have my bases covered here. I didn't run into any problems with Ben when I was back on my computer trying to email myself the notes. They went right under his fucking nose. He has no idea what he's just let me do. Had no problems opening the text document from my infected computer in my email either. I can't describe to you how it feels to finally be able to get the word out in this post. The nightmare ends here. That said, do not download any of my videos or anything about my videos through a YouTube video or audio ripper, a screen grab, whatever. I don't know how he can spread, but I know that just watching them on YouTube and reading my text won't be able to allow him to spread. Otherwise, he wouldn't have needed my help in the first place. But I strongly recommend you do not take anything you see streaming online onto your own personal computer. This will be my last posting. I'm putting up on the forum here for the world. If you see any further comments from me after today's current date, September the 12th, and after the current time, 12 or 8 p.m., discredit them. It already has proven to me that Ben can access my account and password and manipulate my computer. And like I said, I have no idea to what extent it can do this, but know that it will do anything to break free. He is desperate. To ensure your safety, just forget about me, please. And obviously, this goes without saying, but from here on, do not download any images I may have put up, any files, anything. The fifth day will be my last day. I'm going to burn the cartridge and come back to destroy my laptop. Again, even though I don't even know you, this is sort of a bittersweet for me. 
This semester, I really didn't have any friends, or rather, I stopped paying attention to them. But I suppose that's you know, particularly to blame, partially to blame because I'm I'm the genius who picked to live in a single. I suppose someone to get a hold of me and save me before I got too immersed into this game would have literally saved my life. However, it proved too much for me. I'm just glad it happened to me and I could get the warning out so that Ben dies here. Lastly, thank you for taking the time to open this and open yourselves up to me, hearing my story, despite maybe not believing me, you didn't have to do that, really. You shouldn't have. Your support this entire time has kept me going. And now I am finally free of this. Thanks again, Jad Usable. The end. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that ghost story. I I mean I think it's pretty spooky. Let me you know, let us know in the comments. Please, please, please check out the interview with Alex Hall. Uh, he's, he's done a lot more than just write Ben Drowned. And, uh, yeah, guys, have a really good Halloween and we'll see you on a future podcast. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch regarding this week's episode or anything else, you can tweet us at Arcade Attack UK, at Keith Barlow82, and at Arcade underscore Adriano. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcade Attack UK. Please check out our website at arcadeattack.co.uk for lots of retro gaming goodness, interviews, reviews, features, top 10s, etc. And you can also find all our previous podcasts there. Our podcasts are available to stream from the website and from SoundCloud and are available to download for free from Stitcher, Podbean and iTunes, where you can also leave us a review and a rating, which we would really, really appreciate. So until next time, take care and we'll speak to you soon.